from Jamaica. I mean, not Jamaica, he's from Trinidad and Tobago, you know, and, and I, that's one of the islands, and you know, that's kind of like near Jamaica, and you know, all these runners in Jamaica, and wow, what a stereotype that would be. You know, you're, you're making, making all these assumptions along the way. <clears throat> okay. It would be better for them. <clears throat> okay, we're looking uh, at chapter three. We're going to be start chapter three today. continued halfway through March when all sport contests were canceled due to the virus. Um, we're looking at, at um, this chapter as kind of a historical chapter. And if you are going to be a student of sport management, and in particular sport communication, then we have to start sort of at the, at the beginning of it and have a good feel for how it has progressed over the years. Now, a couple of really significant contributors to, to sport management. Uh, Grantland Rice was one, and uh, he's, he is considered to be maybe the first real sportscaster. Uh, he provided play-by-play -play for radio's first coverage of the World Series. Um, he and Bobby Jones, uh, if, you're, if you golf or follow golf, every so often you hear somebody mention Bobby Jones, and it's usually in relation to the Masters. Well, Grantland Rice and Bobby Jones were responsible really for bringing uh, golf into what it is today. And then the preeminent writer for baseball was a guy named Henry Chadwick. Now that's a name that was unfamiliar to me and, and probably is to you. <clears throat> but he's the one that developed a lot of the standards by which we evaluate players. Now it's interesting, baseball maybe more than any other sport, at least in my, my opinion, has, has ways of, of uh, keeping records and, and uh, well this player did this this many times in this particular situation. And it becomes a way of coaching, a way of recruiting. When he started all this, uh, he's the one that came out with the first um, rule book. Uh, and uh, I understand that obviously it's different now, but, but it is based on some of what he did <clears throat> a century ago. So if we look at different periods within sport management or sport industry. We have the early eras of sport journalism, then what we call the golden age, the perspective period, transition years, and then here's where we stick a couple names in, the influences of Roselle and Arledge, Pete Roselle and Rune Arledge, and then today. This is another way to uh, list these eras, uh, what they call the Pioneer Era. This is, this is before 1830, and then the Age of Acceptance, when sport began to be recognized as a, um, a legitimate uh, activity, maybe even a way of life. 
the golden age, the perspective period, and then transition years. And then there's one more there that is an interesting way of looking at it, the agricultural age, which is late 18th century, early 19th, and then the industrial age that, that goes along with the industrial revolution, the late 19th through the 1980s, and then the information age. And that makes sense, doesn't it? The information age, and then the digital age. That's where we are now. At the right, that picture is a boxing match from the 1920s. You know, boxing was not the spectacle that it really is today. You know, no pay-per-view kind of thing. Uh, but it was it was one of the uh, most influential and and uh, most watched sports at the time. So here's some key developments, or key events in the development of sports communication. Now, when we look at a timeline, what it enables us to do is to uh, get the big picture. It doesn't necessarily center on in a particular time area, but it lets us look at it from this end to this end. So we're looking linearly. Um, this this particular time, uh, this this uh, era or the group of eras starts with uh, World War One, and then the attention to sport uh, into the 1920s, the, the cultural changes that come about. And then this golden age, you'll hear about, you'll see, read this a lot. Um, right, the sports writers recognized and satiated, they satisfied the, the want, the desires of fans to know more about the sport. And radio was the primary uh, medium. Oh, let's see. When, when was there no TV? You'd have to ask your, your grandparents, parents, or maybe even great grandparents. Um, network TV, late 40s, probably more like early 50s, I would say. Uh, late 40s, hardly anybody had TVs. Uh, I think our first TV was maybe 1953 or something like that. I was a couple years old. Um, and then we get it in NFL football, and so on and so on. And he takes us all the way to this digital era. And interestingly enough, with the advent of internet, there's literally no event in sport that cannot be broadcast and disseminated to consumers in real time. And that's an interesting statement to say. There's absolutely no sport event. Now you may, well, what about, you know, they did this somewhere, you know, nobody was there. Well, we have the possibility, the technology is there for any sport event to be broadcast in real time. And you, you think about that, you know, the Olympic Games, for example, um, and you know, NBC, I think it's NBC, that has paid billions for the rights of that. And then we'll, we'll see a lot of that in real time. Journalism in the industrial age. Well, to understand this, you have to look at the culture of America at the time. What was going on in the industrial age? Child labor. The picture there on the left shows these little kids on these big machines. Um, kids often went to work before 10, and then uh, you know before 10 years of age, and then they, they probably didn't get much or any education. Um, you have to get a sense of overall journalism during that time. The overall writing, the overriding thing was this idea of social reform. Now, you may say, what's that have to do with sport? All of a sudden, sport journalism gave 
socially conscious journalists the opportunity to take on social reform in the form of what they call muckraking. Now that is not an unfamiliar term to hear, uh, especially in these days as we approach the election. You may hear somebody talk about, well that's just a lot of muckraking, and uh, usually muckraking has a, a negative connotation, but in this case, It's not unlike edit editorial cartoons of today. Journalists portray the horrors of child labor. And you notice over here in this cartoon, the effects of a strike. Well, you know, that is not so far off what we see in modern times. Here's the company owner, and he's still making money, but the person who's on strike, you know, they're, they're working for bread. And one might make a a connection to that in regard to being laid off during the, the virus. And uh, companies will, the other thing, maybe the difference is, you know, there's a lot of companies themselves that went under uh, with that. But uh, these are what the sport journalists of the day were concerned about, social reform, and that's the way they wrote their stories. Sport, here's a quote, sport accommodated participants' desire to play while at the same time enabling the advocates of sport to harness the play impulse for the new industrial order. Basically what they're doing is legitimizing sport in society at this time. You know, leisure was a good thing. You didn't have to work all the time. Uh, there was some disposable money, by that meaning that you know, some people after paying their bills had a little money left over and they would spend it on leisure time activities. You ever heard of the Blue Law? Blue Law refers to uh, something you can't do on Sunday. Uh, for example, um, years ago, when I was growing up, there was a lot of stores that um, participated in what they called blue laws for, for being open or selling alcohol. Now, you, you don't find too many that do that now, but sport was the same way. And it, interestingly enough, it sort of went along with a lot of people's idea of what should be done. Let me ask a, a question that I don't want you to respond to outwardly. I just want you to think about it. But did anybody grow up in a home where um, you know Sunday was the Sabbath and you didn't do anything but just meditate and you know maybe take a nap? But you know, certainly no sports. Um, now that's probably not as prevalent as you would find um, now. My guess is that you, some of your parents or grandparents may have been raised in a culture like that. I certainly was. Um, but at least in terms of this industrial age, um, Sunday was, was not so much a day of you know, recognizing the Sabbath as it was to, you know, Take take uh, take part in leisure time activities. Now, how that how that connects to what I just mentioned? You know, there's kind of dichotomous. Here I'm saying that that uh, there may be you may be from a heritage of, uh, of a family that treated Sunday a little differently than it has been recognized. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact. Uh, You'll recall that Jesus was questioned one time. Now, it's not Sunday. It was the Sabbath there, so it would be Saturday. But Jesus was questioned one time by the Pharisees, and they said, what's, what's the deal with your disciples? They're out there in the cornfield picking corn, and it's a Sabbath. You know, and, uh, and Jesus ended up saying, well, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, which I, I love that. I love that, that statement. Um, 
Um, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't, you know, have some respect in, in things that you do or don't do on, on uh, our Sabbath, the, the Sunday, uh, within Protestant church. Um, but Jesus was simply saying, look, the Son of Man is the, is the Lord of the Sabbath. And so he's taking a little, you know, he's, he's moving from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Also about this time, uh, they begin to have what they call trade papers. You know, they were not so much, you know, exporting news, nothing like that exactly. Uh, there was one called Sporting Life, and it was probably the very first one. But uh, that's, that is beginning to come, come around, and as it does, uh, sport becomes legitimate. Well, here's the golden age of sport. And this is when, this is probably the first time that um, sports, really good athletes in sport, particularly pro athletes, become heroes. And, and likely so. Now here, I just told you earlier that you know, the, even the talking dog knew that, that uh, Babe Ruth was was uh, the finest or one of the finest baseball players ever. Babe Ruth was, he was like uh, bigger than life. I mean, he was, he was a big guy, but he was bigger than life. Uh, probably maybe more money than the president at the time. But the, the other athletes of the day, Ty Cobb, Greg Grange, Bill Tendon, Bobby, Bobby Jones, they were household names because sports writers made them their heroes. They talked about them, they wrote about them, they took pictures of them, they made movies about them. In fact, um, if you've ever seen, there's an old movie that uh, it's black and white, obviously, but it's uh, called The Pride of the Yankees. It's about Lou Gehrig. Now, uh, Lou Gehrig, I, I forget who it is that played Lou Gehrig, but it was done far enough ago that uh, Ben Ruth actually played himself in the movie. Um, he was that big a, you know, he, he wasn't necessarily a movie star, but he, he could make his presence known. Here's a quote from Grant, Grant Lynn Rice, which is the one that we said is the very first sports uh, journalist. He said, um, sport, games, hard competition, played under the rules, is the greatest thing a country can know. Sport offered the greatest fund of national entertainment. It offered relief from the drabness and dullness of making a living. It was a cure for lonesomeness, the dark specter so many people face. That's quite a statement. I don't, I'm not sure that you know, it covers all that. And it was made in 1954, that statement. Is sport that big? Is, is sport something that cures us or or satisfies our loneliness? Does it fill our lives? I guess that would be kind of a personal question. You'd have to answer that for yourself. But with the coming of the golden era of sport journalism, this is what this is what they were experiencing. By the way, Grantland Rice was the one who gave Babe Ruth the title the Sultan of SWAT. The Four Horsemen. Now, you may, if you're not familiar with these Four Horsemen, you may be familiar with uh, where the Book of Revelation talks about the, the Four Horsemen from the north. Well, that's where they got the name. Uh, it just so happened that these were uh, players for Notre Dame back in uh, 1924. That was a starting backfield. And uh, here's Here's an interesting description or categorization of sports writers and how they were considered. They were either what they called G wizards or what they called ah nuts. <laughs> this is the way they wrote. They wrote in such a way that they were, it was G wizards. Or they wrote in such a way that 
read it. Um, so here's here's an example of Grant, Grantland Rice's um, story about the four horsemen, and this would be considered one of these G wizards. Um, outlined against a blue gray sky. The four horsemen rode again. In dramatic allure, they are known as famine, pestilence, destruction, and death. Under the Bible. These are only aliases. Their real names are Stolbray or Miller, Crowley, and Layden. They form the crest of the South Bend Cyclone, before which another fighting army team was swept over the precipice at the Polo Grounds this afternoon as 55,000 spectators peered down upon the bewildering panorama spread out upon the green plain below. What a statement. Now, if that's not a gee wizard statement, I don't know what is. I mean, you could really get, you know, if you're an older day fan especially, you could, you could really get all excited about that. The Four Horsemen of Notre Dame. Um, here's a side light. Franklin Rice, who wrote that, that quote, um, at the time, in 1925, he made as much as Babe Ruth did, $52,000. Can you imagine what $52,000 would be in today's money? So we know what you know what some of the ball players get these days, and, and that's that would be kind of the equivalent, I guess. G Wizard and I'm um, nuts. Here's an example of. A writer who was kind of an odd uh, nuts. His name was Ray Wagner. And here's his account of the 1910 Chicago White Sox versus the Philadelphia Athletics game. On my right sat a gent who knew, who knew something, and he soon gave evidence of the fact. Morris Rath opened the Sox attack with a safe bunt. He was nailed at second when Lord missed his swing at a hit and run. Stealing second with nobody out, remarked that guy, who knows. And the papers called him a brainy ballpen player. If he had good sense, he'd trade all his brains for a little bit of ability. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a, uh, nuts. Last night, um, the movie just happened to be on uh, The Natural. Anybody ever seen The Natural? Okay. With Robert Redford. And it's kind of a, a mystical, well, uh, it's mystical, it's not mystical, but uh, one of the best sports movies that's ever been made, I think. Uh, if you ever get a chance to watch The Natural, it's, it's really good. And I was just thinking about how this particular team they were playing, it was a a team called the New York, New York Knights. It was the major leagues, and you know they they were up and down in terms of their play. And there was one sports writer who was also a, kind of a an illustrator, and he would make kind of like a caricature, and it would it would relate to what this particular player in question was doing or what. What the fans thought he should do. Anyhow, this he was definitely kind of an on nuts writer. We are gonna stop there. This is what we're gonna pick up on Tuesday. But here's what I'd like you to do in the remaining time. I'd like now, I know that you can't gather together, you know, you can't move your desk or anything like that real close. But if you could just turn around and in a position that you can talk to two or three other people, you know, like for instance, people you guys can talk to each other and move forward, just kind of pair it up somehow. What I want you to do is to come up with an example of. A G whiz statement and an aw nuts statement. And put it in today's language and today's athletes. You know, think about some ball player, some athlete, some kind of athlete. And you're the G 
journalist, and you're going to come up with a short quote that is a gee whiz statement. And you don't have to use the same athlete or the uh, nuts. Okay, so spend a little time doing that. Just you can talk to those that are close to you. Just go move your desk. Thank <laughs> you.